Hi, welcome to Cannabis MD Profile. I'm very excited to be hosting Dr. Peter Grinspoon uh, today. We'll get into that in just a moment. I'm Jackie Cohen Roth, founder and CEO of two social enterprises, Cannabis MD and TPAD, and the nonprofit TPAD Foundation. Cannabis MD is committed to filling the void of cannabis science and policy education via workforce development for entry into the high growth industry as well as physician advanced practice provider and senior leadership in the industry education. TPAD is focused on advancing women and people of color in cannabis STEM. The TPAD Foundation Board and I are focused on raising money to execute our mission to break down barriers to entry and advancement in the cannabis industry, no matter gender or race, via education. And we are focused on executing that via the TPED Fellowship Program that's going to provide foundations in cannabis science and policy education with a paid internship that will lead to our intention as a full-time paid job within the industry. On June 16th, I'm hosting a doubleheader in Boston, the Cannabis MD Cannabis Science and Policy Forum that will be followed up by TPED. I'm excited to share that the forum will be hybrid. So we're going to be in person at the beautiful Boston Seaport offices of Foley Hoeg, and then we'll also be on Zoom. Uh, the forum's going to run from 9.30 to 4.30 with a keynote uh, delivered by Dr. Jordan Tischler, and then four roundtable discussions, all centered on medical cannabis, the, whether it's clinical and research applications, Federal and uh, federal and state regulatory considerations, and then the final roundtable discussion focuses on emerging trends and innovation in the medical cannabis industry. Uh, Dr. Grinspoon will be a member of that clinical and research applications roundtable, and then I'm very excited to have him moderate the fourth roundtable on. Um, emerging trends and innovation. Registration and the full list of uh, our subject matter experts uh, really pulled in the, the best. I'm so grateful for the people who are joining us at the forum and that can be found on Cannabis MD. As I shared, uh, the forum is gonna be followed by TPAD and we are bringing the live jazz, good eats, plentiful libations and provocative conversation that every TPAD is famous for it, and we are bringing that to Boston. Uh, TPAD's going to follow the forum right at the same location at the Boston Seaport offices of Foley Hoeg. And um, I'm uh, thrilled that Helen Gomez Andrews is our featured guest speaker at TPAD. Uh, Helen's cannabis dispensary, the high end, became the first cannabis company in Massachusetts to be certified both as a minority business enterprise, that's an MBE, and a woman business enterprise, a WBE. She's also an uh, advisory board member for the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission. And uh, so now bringing on board uh, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jackie. Yeah, so um, Dr. Grinspoon is a primary care physician, cannabis specialist, and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. He's the author of a new book, Seeing Through the Smoke. There it is, a cannabis expert untangles the truth about marijuana. He is a TEDx speaker, a national media figure, a board member of the Physicians Advocacy Group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, and a graduate of one of my favorite colleges, Swarthmore College, <laughs> which <laughs> turns out, some of the smartest and kindest people on the planet that are, are making great change in the world. So welcome, Dr. Grinspoon. Thank you. So delighted to be here. Yeah. So I have uh, been making my way through your book and um, I'm going to read a quote that I, I uh, that you shared on LinkedIn that I wholeheartedly agree with. This is a, a testimonial on your book. Um, by Dr. or uh, is it Dr. Ethan Adelman, who is founder and former executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. And he says about the book, uh, Peter Grinspoon is an ex-addict, marijuana enthusiast, cannabis prescribing physician with a professional and moral obligation to know and tell the truth about cannabis's relationship to driving, pregnancy, psychosis, autism, addiction, sleep, cancer, and much more. Never before have I read such an engaging and accessible review of the evidence. And uh, portions of the book, I mean, I'm just amazed. It's one of the things I wanna ask you about is the process of writing this book, um, where you also include the history of um, US drug policy, 
and um, you you share some fir- first person accounts that really brings to life um, what I refer to as a social inequity uh, in U.S. Uh, in the U.S. cannabis industry, as well as some really power- powerful um, um, information about the um, clinical applications to cannabis, and certainly your your personal story. So. Um, if you would, let's get going with um, a little bit of your, your personal story and, and what brought you into uh, actually practicing with cannabis. Well, you know, people ask me how long it took me to write, you know, this book, Seeing Through yeah. the Smoke, which is a pretty uh, panoramic, uh, as you're discovering, <laughs> view of cannabis. It talks, about the, <laughs> it, it talks about the social history and about the war on cannabis users and about how the practice of medicine and how doctors are sort of on the wrong side of the war on drugs. And then, then it talks about all the harms and all the benefits, both real and imagined harms. And it goes to the latest science. And then it also has a chapter on like recreational lifestyle enhancement uses, which is something that historically has been sort of heretical for a doctor to talk about every time I've spoken about, well, cannabis can help people with insight and creativity and sexuality. I get, uh, you know, really snipped at by, by members of my profession that say, don't, you know, why are you um, encouraging cannabis use? And I'm not encouraging cannabis use. I'm encouraging a, a balanced and open discussion about the actual harms and the actual benefits because we've been misled about it for so long during the war on drugs. And for people to make an informed choice about anything, about a surgery, you say, these are the benefits and these are the harms. And then the patient makes an informed decision. You can't make an informed decision about any drug, including, and particularly something as complex as cannabis, unless you truly have a balanced, neutral, and reasoned discussion about both the harms and the benefits. So, you know, I've said things in the book that get people on both sides a little bit upset, but uh, I figure if you're getting sort of shot at equally by both sides, you're doing a a pretty good job. Yeah. And you've identified two camps um, that those are very for, and those are very against it. Would you share those, uh, the names? Well, Well, I made a big effort to like, give the argument from both sides and then mm-hmm. to say what I thought and then to go through the science and say what the science um, uh, sort of dictates. And the one side I called the canatopians. They're the people uh-huh. who, uh, you know, it's like, it's a whole range of people for anybody who like mildly supports cannabis to the, you know, fanatics you have in any political, religious or social movement. And, you know, I, I, I talk about some of their, their beliefs, you know, such as many believe that cannabis can cure cancer. Cannabis mm-hmm. hasn't been shown to cure cancer in humans. It's spectacular for the symptoms of cancer and for the symptoms of chemotherapy, but it doesn't cure cancer. If you have cancer, you have the oncologist cure cancer with chemotherapy and you use the cannabis to treat the symptoms of the cancer and the treatment. Uh, On the other side, I I go through a lot of the uh, sort of negativity about cannabis and really going back to my dad's book in 1971, he wrote a book called Marijuana Reconsidered. Um, which really, he, he was one of the first people to sort of publicly, to understand and to publicly state that the criminalization of cannabis has been so much more harmful than the actual use of cannabis for most people. But I, but I do talk about, you know, I'm, I'm, it certainly isn't safe to drive when you're high. And I talk about, we don't know that it's safe at all during pregnancy or breastfeeding. So it should be used under very specific circumstances, you know, like cases where you can't treat with safer drugs. You always look as a doctor for the safest drug or medicine you possibly can. And I talk about teen use and cognition. So I go through the whole gamut of harms and benefits and try to come up with like a reasonable uh, answer to all of these questions, some of which we, the jury's still out on, but a reasonable compromise position. And then I, I, it's really heavily documented by the science. So it'd be really interesting. I, I, the whole point of it is to try to move people closer together because depending on who you talk to about cannabis, you can get a completely different perspective. And it's like, it's not functional at all for our society to have like these mutually exclusive, non-overlapping views about cannabis. It confuses everybody. Yeah. And I always, um, one of the things that I always say about cannabis is that it's not benign. You know, there's certainly, as you said, there's a, there's a whole lot of benefit to it, potential therapeutic benefits, um, as well as there's risks that, that we're going to talk about um, just in a bit that, that uh, certain age groups um, that shouldn't be using cannabis. Uh, I know that from what I've gone through with my graduate studies, the messaging that I told uh, my kids while I was raising them, if I were doing it all over again, I'd have a different message um, as, as far as raising teens. So um, backing up a bit is that, so um, when did you start including cannabis in your practice? 
treating patients with cannabis? Well, backing up even a little more, because I didn't answer your first question. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how Good. I got involved in this issue. And, and yeah. it, was, it took me about five years to write, but I've been involved in this issue my entire life. For mm-hmm. two reasons. One, as I alluded to earlier, my father, Dr. Lester Grinspoon, was a very sort of legendary cannabis scholar. And he worked on this issue for the last half century, literally to his last breath, he worked on legalization and education. And also in the 1970s, my brother Danny was fighting an unsuccessful battle with leukemia. And my parents broke the law and bought him cannabis illegally. And it, it this was like transformative how it helped him. Didn't cure his cancer, but it absolutely helped him eat um, you know, engage, interact, play with his little brothers, uh, hold down food, maintain his weight. And, and there are very few things that are as impactful as seeing the alleviation of, of suffering in a family member. So I've been involved in the cannabis issue my whole life, just witnessing uh, the benefit it had on my brother. I knew for a fact, as a kid, the cannabis was a medicine, at least for certain people under certain conditions. And I took that through my medical education and was really immune to a lot of the nonsense uh, they taught us in medical school. It was really awful. They still don't teach us very much at all that's helpful about mm-hmm. cannabis, but a little bit better than it was. So I've been treating patients um, with cannabis, recommending it, um, and now certifying patients now that it's become legal in Massachusetts uh, for the last 10 years or so since the beginning of my quarter century career as a primary care doctor. So since the very beginning, I've been incorporating it in how I discuss uh, certain diseases with patients and for example, migraines, it's always been very good to help people with migraines. We have other medications to treat migraines as well, but you'd have to argue that these other medications are safer than cannabis. I mean, in the people, people, you know, having cannabis as a doctor just gives you more tools in your toolbox. And I think what is going to amaze doctors as they adopt medical cannabis is how much easier it makes your life as a doctor, because you just have an extra you know, relatively non-toxic plant-based medication that the patients love to treat with some of the most difficult things to treat, like insomnia, anxiety, or chronic pain. So I think it's going to be very widely adopted again uh, by the medical community. It was adopted until it was criminalized. One of the main voices against criminalizing it was the American Medical Association. So uh, we're really coming full circle in a lot of ways on the cannabis issue. Yeah, you have some really, I mean, what I love about the book is some powerful, powerful quotes that you bring in and the history is of where the AMA came out supportive and, you know, uh, speaking to as with the Schaefer Commission report under um, Nixon's administration and that it was not harmful as it was portrayed to be. And then what the most recent um, consideration by the AMA, the American Medical uh, association has on cannabis. So, so with that, there's a data point that I, I regularly refer to is that why this education is so necessary is that if we were to fully legalize medical cannabis across the country, which we're getting closer and closer to with 38 states, uh, 20, 38 states having medical, 22 now have adult use. Of course, not every market is, is fully open. Uh, if we were to have a medical cannabis available in every single state, using a very conservative calculation, that's 9 million patients. Meanwhile, we have less than 9% of medical schools include cannabis science, endocannabinoid science, whatever you refer to it, um, as in their, uh, in their curriculum. So we have this chasm, this void that is really necessary that we fill. So that's what you're focused on doing. That's what I'm focused on doing. And so I'm curious, and as have you have seen the shift in particular, you're in, you know, part of a very um, well uh, established, esteemed um, medical school program, you know, Harvard Medical School. And um, so how is the reception? Have, have you seen a shift? And, and some growth in uh, definitely a shift, definitely a growth. Definitely, doctors are are sort of following their patients, but uh, accepting it. You know, it's really interesting what uh, how supportive a particular group of doctors seems to be on cannabis depends a little bit on their vantage point. For example, it's hard to find an oncologist that's not in, in favor of medical cannabis because it helps their patients with the cancer pain and tolerate the chemotherapy. The doctors who tend to be very against it are, for example, the pediatric psychiatrists who tend to see the rare but tragic cases where cannabis can destabilize someone who's psychotic, a young adult or a teenager. And, you know, it's sort of like confirmation bias. If that's what you see every day, you can think of cannabis as a very dangerous thing. So I think that what different doctors think tends to depend on their vantage point. 
Generally, over time, doctors used to support it until it was criminalized. Then they were bludgeoned by government pressure okay. to be against it. And they were really, they were just on the wrong side of the war on drugs, which is very shameful. I have a whole chapter on that called Do Be No Harm. Doctors are supposed to do no harm. And they were just on the wrong side of the war on drugs. And it's like incalculable, the damage and the harm that they uh, caused by just parroting government misinformation and not thinking for themselves on the cannabis issue or on the issue of other drugs of misuse as well, which shouldn't be so heavily criminalized and stigmatized as they are. Now, because patients, uh, 94% in one poll of patients, another poll said 89% of Americans support legal access to medical cannabis. Now, name something else that 94% of Americans agree upon. Like, who would have thought cannabis would be the great uniters? And the doctors are sort of having hearing is percolating, percolating up. It's not coming from the medical schools. As you mentioned, they they only teach the endocannabinoid system in 13% of medical schools, which is just shameful. Even if you're anti-cannabis, even if you couldn't care less about cannabis, you need to understand the endocannabinoid system, the system of uh, receptors and uh, neurotransmitters by which cannabis works its effect. Um, it really, it's involved so centrally in homeostasis and the body keeping itself in balance. But doctors are coming along, they're they're having so much, uh, hearing so many success stories from their patients, and I think they're getting on board. I'd say about two-thirds of doctors now are pretty much committed to the notion that the cannabis is an effective medicine. But, you know, certainly, again, with this issue, it's so polarizing, and there's so much misinformation. And for uh, physicians to really adopt it, they're going to require a lot of, like, unlearning of a lot of the nonsense they've been able to, they've been taught, a lot of humility to sort of say we were, you know, didn't do a great job in this and just a lot of education on the practical aspects. Because the final thing I'll say is that most um, polls show that the patients want to get their information on medical cannabis yeah. from their doctors, but very few of them do because when they talk to their doctors, their doctors don't know very much okay. this practical and that's helpful. So then they end up going to the bud tenders, which is in truth, not particularly appropriate because the bud tenders aren't medically certified or trained. And then the doctors complain about the bud tenders, but it's like, Hey, you can't complain the, about the bud tenders. If you can't do any better, why don't you get educated so that you could help the patients who want you to help them in the first place. So I think there's a little bit of hypocrisy and a lot of education that needs to be done uh, to get doctors up to speed on, on cannabis. Yeah, and that's a, then um, um, your points are a great segue into the question, and you talk about this at great length in the book, is that one of the challenges with getting the physicians on board is the lack of um, controlled studies, that randomized controlled studies, RCT. And then you talk about the value of real world uh, evidence, and there was a particular study that you cited. And um, so we do have so many of these anecdotal stories and we hosted on, uh, on Cannabis MD is that I do that purposefully so that our readers and physicians, including physicians that understand that the patients are finding value. And then, you know, as you said, it's unfortunate is that the physicians don't have, you know, there's so many things that are wrong and out of balance of, you know, anywhere from them not having education to the physicians asking, well, how was your experience when you went to the dispensary? What did the bud tender tell you? And then you have the bud tender who has minimal education, clinical education and understanding, um, you know, and no, no fault of theirs. It's, uh, you know, where they're working. Many states um, require that they have cannabis education, some amount, but then there's, you know, compliance um, by the dispensers that they, they work for and with, and then to have the regulatory uh, agencies actually enforce um, the education. So um, without going off to my diatribe on the lack of education is then talk about the value of um, real world uh, evidence. And if you would explain exactly what that is. Absolutely. So, I mean, randomized control trials are really important, but they're not a hundred percent of the evidence that we use or have in medicine um, by any means. Uh, lithium, aspirin, they were invented before the randomized control trial uh, was invented. And we've been using those for a hundred years. Uh, you know, much of what we do in medicine is ideally dictated by randomized control trials because in these, you know, they're placebo, they're blinded. The doctor doesn't know which medicine or the placebo, the patient doesn't know. It takes away the placebo effect and all the biases. So randomized control trials are, are definitely a good thing and they're definitely helpful. But there's so many things that we do in medicine that are not dictated by randomized control trials. And I just think as with everything cannabis related, there's a real double standard. 
uh, there's a higher standard for cannabis. So a lot of doctors are saying, well, we don't have the randomized controlled trials to, for example, recommend it for anxiety. But first of all, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to blind cannabis. Most people know whether they've been given cannabis or placebo. That's why they've been using it for 5,000 years. So second of all, um, you know, we treat cannabis use disorder, cannabis addiction. I treat that all the time. I think I'm really good at it because I'm not judgmental. I unfortunately have a history of opiate addiction and I understand cannabis really well. So I treat this all the time. And there's not a single FDA approved um, <laughs> medicine for, um, for cannabis addiction, but people give uh, patients, you know, the gabapentin or Ambien to sleep and so forth, or a benzodiazepine for the anxiety you can get withdrawing from cannabis. And how is it that to use medical cannabis, you need a randomized control trial, but to treat cannabis use disorder, you could just use whatever the doctor thinks is a good idea. I mean, again, it's just a double standard. There are a lot of things we do in medicine that we do because we feel, believe, or perceive them to be helpful. And then real world evidence isn't just anecdotal studies. You know, the problem with anecdotal studies is my dad pointed out in his 1993 book, Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine, is the anecdotal fa fallacy. If an if a medicine uh, works, you hear about it. If it doesn't work, you don't. And that gives you the impression that these anecdotes can be more effective. The treatment can be more effective than you think it is. But real world data is increasingly accepted and established. And it's like patient measured outcomes, like thousands of them, or patient registries, or uh, surveillance data, or state registries. I mean, it's aggregating thousands of patient data points together. So it's sort of like I guess anecdotes on steroids, but they they have very uh, very um, sophisticated ways to aggregate and to and, and to factor in the data. So it's becoming increasingly accepted across medicine. It's particularly helpful for cannabis, where it's still Schedule One, for example, in the United States, and it's very difficult to do and expensive to do the randomized control trials that doctors look for. So I don't view it as like randomized control trials versus real world evidence. I think they really complement each other and always have complemented each other and are particularly complementary for cannabis where it's difficult to do the traditional types of research. And it's giving us the tools. I mean, very few people will argue these days that cannabis, for example, isn't a good treatment for chronic pain. Uh, I mean, if they are arguing that they're not looking at the right data or they've got their own preconceived notions that are really blocking their understanding of the fact that millions of people are using it for chronic pain. And I, and I think part of the progress we're making is exactly what you say. It's because medicine in general and epidemiologists and scientists are becoming much more accepting and uh, welcoming of real world data. And that's really helping us in the cannabis realm and in the psychedelics realm. It's very hard to, to blind people to psychedelics. Something like 98% of people guess whether they've been given the placebo or given the active ingredient. I personally, who have had plenty of experience with virtually every drug in my past, would note the difference if I were given a placebo or 100 micrograms of LSD and the walls were melting. I mean, obviously, uh, you can't blind these people very effectively. And that's another example of where real world evidence might become really, really helpful. Yeah. You know, and so then that goes to, you know, this question about or the value of the data and how can we collect this data and that there are, you know, the regulatory bodies um, have that ability to, to collect this information, um, you know, purchases. Is there anything out there that you're seeing that as a data collection, a repository, somebody or a platform is doing it better than another? Well, I think um, there are a bunch of groups in England that are doing a really, really good job. Like the Sapphire Clinic, they wrote a really good um, paper um, about real world evidence, which I cite in my book. Um, and I think that uh, there, there are some researchers like Kevin Boniki uh, in the U.S. He just joined our group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. He's written really good papers about the different programs in the U.S. Some of them are affiliated with the state legalization programs because, as you allude to, they have like captive audience. They know what people are using cannabis for and how they're using it. So I think that we're making like incredibly rapid progress on this. It's almost hard to keep up with the progress we're making. Um, and again, I think that it's really tragic that cannabis is still level schedule one in the controlled substance act, which makes it harder to do other types of research, uh, at least in the United States. So I think we're going to overcome that. You know, Biden says he's going to reschedule. Um, they're doing a lot of research in other countries. So I think we're going to have much more of both types of research, the randomized control trials that satisfy, you know, even the stuffiest of doctors and the real world evidence that is 
more on the cutting edge, but more representative of what people are actually taking and doing. So I, again, I think we're, we're getting there quickly. And, you know, that's just even, you know, when I wrote my book, I had to submit it like eight months ago. And even in the eight months, there've been so many studies. Nice. I was out. actually going to ask oh, you that. I'd love to include in my book. Um, yeah. Very painful watching these studies come in right after you turned in your manuscript and you're like, oh, I could have included that a week ago. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I've gone through that. I, I wrote a paper. Um, I was very excited to have it in a peer, published in a peer reviewed journal. I got back five pages of edits and I don't have time right now to get to them. And but, you know, when I do, it's like, oh, your book is actually going to be one of my my valued resources on that. But uh, yeah, it is. As you said, I mean, there's information that seemingly every day we're learning, you know, there's more right before we got on, um, you know, topics uh, focused on the minor cannabinoids and the value of the minor cannabinoids. Um, so let's get into some of the clinical effects that you that you spoke of in treating. And one is um, certainly as a, a great concern um, is as the markets uh, uh, convert from a single medical adult use program tool that dual licensed state where it's inclusive of, of uh, an adult use. So, um, and then there's always that concern about whether it's going to be greater access for juveniles. So um, what do you have to say first? I mean, you've experienced it in Massachusetts um, as the transition from a medical program to an adult use. Uh, are you seeing more juvenile use? And then, so there's a two part question. Are you seeing more juvenile access unintended, you know, that it's illegal? And then I wanna talk about um, what the what cannabis does. And there's a lot of conversation that we have that the weed today is not the weed that we had in high school. So let's start off with uh, the first part of the question is, do you see an increase in illicit use by juveniles? I don't. Um, I mean, you know, the cannabis has always been available to juveniles. It's been a very mm -hmm. popular drug in this country. You know, we say just say wait, you know, at least until you're 18, because there is concern that heavy cannabis use before the age of 18, particularly before the age of 16, can affect uh, brain development. Now, it's nothing, you know, like fetal alcohol syndrome. These kids are going to be fine. You know, the whole crack baby thing turned out to mm -hmm. be a whole big nothing burger of drug war nonsense. So it's not like anything terrible would happen, but we, we really do not want kids to be using cannabis until they're 18. I always certainly ideally till they're 25, but nobody's going to wait until they're 25. We don't want them using alcohol either or other drugs just because their brains are developing and are very fragile. Though that said with legalization, there hasn't been any good data that um, teen rates have been rising. And there've been several theories about why rates have been stable, if not dropping. One is that, you know, drug dealers will sell to anybody, but the dispensaries check your ID. If there's like the slightest, you know, misspelling in your ID, it doesn't match up with your cannabis card or your driver's license. They don't let you in the door. So it might be harder for teens to get it, or it might just be a little bit more boring and less like exotic, like your parents are smoking pot. It's like, that's not cool. That's not an interesting way to rebel. But I do think that teens are susceptible to cannabis use because their brains are programmed for novelty and for thrill seeking. That's just how they're programmed. And cannabis is interesting. It is fun. And the whole dare program of like lying about cannabis and saying, this is horrible, horrible things are going to happen. Nothing to see here. This isn't fun at all. Like the minute you lose credibility with a teenager, sort of like the minute you lose credibility with the judge, you're sunk. It's going to take you years to get it back rather than if ever. And I, I think lying to teenagers and trying to pretend that it's this awful thing or that horrible things are going to happen to you completely backfired. That actually had no effect if it didn't increase not only cannabis use, but the use of other more dangerous drugs. So I'm a big believer in being very, very honest with teenagers. And you don't freak out if they tried it because they're 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 wired for novelty seeking, but you really do have to communicate to them firmly and clearly that cannabis is bad for their brains and they need to wait until they're older if they want to avoid harming themselves. Yeah. One of my kids say, you know, that I, whenever, uh, <laughs> if you know, we're both adults and uh, medicating and she says, mom, you're the one person who can make getting high so unfun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe everybody should be dropping uh, Terpene Tuesday and, and whatever else uh, I say to my daughter. Um, so let's talk about psychosis. And there was a really interesting data point that you include in the book where actually, what is it? The incidence of psychosis is actually flatlined. Um, well, and psychosis is a loaded yeah. word. 
So yeah, okay, let's the go there. Key point of the prohibitionists is that um, yeah. cannabis causes schizophrenia. Uh, and schizophrenia is a, a very common type of uh, psychosis. Um, most people are familiar with what schizophrenia is. Now, schizophrenia has been a, about 1% of the US population, uh, the worldwide population, actually, uh, for the last 70 years. It hasn't gone up. And the rates of cannabis users have gone up worldwide from like in the hundreds of thousands in the 1950s to the hundreds of millions currently. And the rates of schizophrenia have been flat, like rock stable at about 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. So it is literally impossible that cannabis is causing schizophrenia or we'd have higher rates. Now that said, cannabis can, along with other things like steroids, amphetamines that used to treat ADHD, alcohol, tobacco, hallucinogens, steroids can precipitate, or cannabis can precipitate schizophrenia earlier in any given patient that has a genetic predisposition to developing schizophrenia. And that's a really big deal because if you get schizophrenia when you're 21, as opposed to 27, there's that's six years where you're not developing adult skills, life skills, functioning skills, and your um, functioning tends to be worse. So cannabis does have an effect on psychosis and it can trigger it. Also, you have something called a substance induced psychosis. Again, it's not just cannabis. There's also alcohol or amphetamines or steroids can, or hallucinogens can cause weeks of psychosis just from using the substance, even after the effects of the substance have worn off. Cannabis is the most uh, common culprit of this. So cannabis can cause a substance-induced psychosis, and cannabis certainly can destabilize people with psychosis uh, who have bipolar who are schizophrenia and make them worse. So cannabis does worsen and aggravate psychosis. And in some situations, it can cause a certain type of psychosis, but it doesn't cause schizophrenia, which has been the main talking point of uh, the war on drugs. And it's just sort of a nuanced point, uh, which is sort of what my book is about. Like one side gets this wrong. That's this, uh, the Canatopians is, uh, get it wrong and say that, you know, cannabis has no role or in the development of psychosis. It's not true. And the prohibitionists, the reefer pessimists get it wrong. And they say the cannabis is causing schizophrenia and neither are true. And I try to give a more nuanced uh, citing virtually all the recent science um, to the extent that I could, there's a lot of it uh, really evidencing my position for sort of a nuanced position, which is very important because people are going to use cannabis, but how can we, how can we have them use it in a way that maximizes benefit and minimizes harm, including psychosis? Yeah, thank you for that. And then that's a great um, transition into talking about cannabis use disorder. And so, uh, you, you know, because of these uh, THC uh, counts are higher, you know, are you seeing a greater, have you seen in your practice, are you seeing a greater incidence of CUD? Absolutely not. Um, I, okay. I believe the cannabis can be addicted, addictive. I treat cannabis use disorder, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it has to do with the potency. Uh, you know, when you'd have to say that smoking half a joint in five minutes causes more addiction than smoking a full joint in 10 minutes, which is half as strong. That doesn't make any sense. That's like saying, you know, you're more likely to get addicted to port wine than to regular wine because it's twice as strong. Um, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think that's been really blown out of proportion. In fact, I sort of criticized to the point of satirizing certain studies in my book uh, that claim the, the other otherwise. But the rates of cannabis addiction have been greatly exaggerated by the psychiatrists, I believe, uh, largely because they don't know much about the benefits of cannabis mm -hmm. and they don't actually treat people with, with cannabis. And as I mentioned earlier, their vantage point is just seeing the train wrecks. Um, so I, I, but I don't think they understand it that well. And th their definitions are overly broad. To get a definition of cannabis use disorder, you merely need to do two of 11 criteria, one of which mm -hmm. is tolerance the other of which is withdrawal. Now, most medical cannabis patients have tolerance and withdrawal. In fact, when we define addiction to medicinal opiates, we don't use tolerance and withdrawal because we would rope in all of the medicinal opiate patients. They all have tolerance and withdrawal. And why pathologize all of them? Why give them a diagnosis of addiction when they're not addicted, which just stigmatizes them and gets them treated worse by everybody? And it's the same thing with cannabis. It can be addicted, but you can't diagnose it according to tolerance or withdrawal, because virtually all the medical uh, patients have tolerance and withdrawal. And they're needlessly pathologizing uh, like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of medical cannabis patients. Again, it's not a benign thing to give someone a diagnosis of an addiction. Doctors don't treat you as well. They don't give you pain medications. It's really, really horrible how we treat people in this country with addiction. So I think we need to sort of 
reset and redefine cannabis addiction so that we actually, someone who is addicted can get the empathy and care that they need. It really, some people truly get addicted, but at the same time, not to needlessly overly rope in uh, all these people that are using it with good benefit and don't really have any of the other stig stigmata of addiction, like continued use despite negative consequences, like obsessive use and so forth. So we have a lot of work to do. And I just think uh, it's very tragic that so many people have been sort of like over diagnosed. I mean, Lena Wen, um, the former public health commissioner of, I don't know, Maryland, Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore. I actually, she was in my magazine in my previous professional life. Yeah, when she was a uh, commissioner of Baltimore City Health Department. Right, she had an op-ed in the Washington Post yeah. three days yeah, ago. Yeah, I saw that. to the editor three days ago. Yeah. Like, criticizing her for saying like 30% of adult adults who use cannabis in the U S are addicted. I mean, that's like complete nonsense. Like yeah. you have to have like less than zero comprehension or awareness or understanding of cannabis. You have to actually know things that aren't true and not know anything that's true to make a statement like that. Uh, you know, it's probably something like three to 8%, but it's not 30%. And furthermore, like not all addiction is created easy equal. I was addicted to opiates 15 years ago. I lost my medical license. I had a really deadly addiction to prescription opiates. That's actually what my first book was about, how to get addicted as a doctor and how to get unaddicted. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with cannabis addiction, there's certainly people that don't meet their life goals, that are stuck in their parents' basement, that are smoking their lives away. And it's very tragic, but they're not as frantically desperate as people who are withdrawing from opiate. Opiates are. Nobody's like robbing pharmacies or like injuring themselves to get opiates. So, you know, there's a lot more that we need to define about the quality of the addiction and the way it affects your life. In addition to just the numbers of people that are addicted, because you certainly can't claim that opiate addiction, which is like soul crushing or alcohol addiction or benzodiazepine addiction, which are lethal or the same thing as cannabis addiction. So I just think there's, it's been really dominated by the psychiatrists for the last half century. They haven't had that, to be honest, uh, a clear distinction between what the government says and what they believe. They haven't, you know, my dad was a psychiatrist who was able to think for himself in this issue 52 years ago. I, I just think there needs to be more independent thinking and less, less like uh, politics in terms of like how the psychiatrists and how society as a whole addresses this whole issue of cannabis addiction. Cause we can't be over diagnosing people, but we also don't want to not provide empathy and treatment for the people that need it. So um, with your patients, do you recommend a tolerance break? Uh, yeah, for the patients who use it a ton. I mean, I some yeah. patients use it like way more than than I think they should be using it. You know, it's nuanced, it's complicated, like it's helping their them in some ways, but I think it would be helping them a lot more if they're using a lot less of it. And mm -hmm. if the more of many medications, the more you use it, the less it works. Look at Ambien, the mm -hmm. sleep medication or any mm -hmm. sleep medication, if you use it all the time, it doesn't make you as sleepy. You get tolerant to it. And that's certainly true with cannabis. So tolerance breaks helps. And I often like have people still use cannabis, but just try to have a more, a less out of control relationship with it, not mm -hmm. smoking all the time, maybe being more mindful and deliberate, use it a couple of times a day instead of puffing on their vape pens, you know, 15 times a day, that doesn't help anybody. Mm -hmm. Would it make a difference if they're using more CBD than THC? If they well, yes. manage it? Through? That's the other thing I wanted to mention with the yeah. adoption of recreational. A lot of mm -hmm. medical patients feel they're sort of being cast away to the side and they're feeling like there's too much of an emphasis on high THC, which is what the mm -hmm. recreational users want and not nearly enough of an emphasis on incorporating some of the other more medicinal um, cannabinoids such as CBD, uh, CBN, CBC, CBG. So um, I, I certainly think that a lot more attention has to be paid. I, I don't think we should have limits on like can, uh, THC has to be less than 10%. That's just makes people smoke twice as much and it yeah. makes it twice as expensive for people on fi fixed incomes, like our veterans and our older uh, Americans. So I think that causes more harm than good, but at the same time, there needs to be a lot more uh, incentives and in education, not to just have high THC overall, but to have a moderate amount of THC and to incorporate more of these medicinal ca cannabinoids. This would be healthier for both, both recreational and medicinal users. It would be healthier for everyone. And I, I think we're a little bit, uh, we fetishize high THC uh, at the expense of all these other spectacular components in cannabis. And I think we could offer much more balanced and in, in, in medicinal products to everybody. Mm -hmm. What's been the impact that with um, adults, you know, where the state I'm in, um, Maryland, our adult use program is scheduled to go live July 1. And uh, 
you know, so I'm, I'm very aware of uh, the work that I do is that there is a decrease in the medical market and patient access when an adult use market goes live. And you know, what are the protections that are put in place to protect patients' access, that they have access to those products that, you know, as we're talking about the high THC, that where those more of the, na the, the naive or new adult use um, consumers think like, oh, I've heard it's THC and it's high THC. I got to go in and get that when they're actually robbing patients who require that. But um, more so to my question is that what impact on your medical practice, if any, um, from that transition of a medical only state to both adult use and um, a medical market? Well, first, many, um, and I'm sure I'm going to forget to list some of them, but First yeah. of all, because it's easy for people to get uh, adult use cannabis, um, they could just go to the store. There are like three times as many recreational dispensaries as medical dispensaries. And to go to a medical dispensary, you have to pay to get a card. You see a, a special, a cannabis specialist or go to one of those card mills, which I don't think are that helpful. Um, so a lot of people are just bypassing the whole get a medical card process because it's so easy. Now, you do get a 20% break on the price in Massachusetts if you get a medical card which is really good if you use it a lot. If you use it once a month for a migraine, you don't really need the 20% break. So I think a lot of people are just getting access in cannabis and there have been polls, poll after poll of people, what people get in recreational dispensaries and something like two thirds is, are using it for anxiety and you know three quarters are using it for chronic pain. So I think people are just buying it through the recreational system because it's easier if a little bit more expensive and using it medicinally. And that denies all of us an opportunity to have a doctor patient relationship and um, a really important discussion about side effects, harms, ways to maximize benefit, ways to minimize the dose, ways to get started so you don't overconsume, ways to incorporate other more medicinal cannabinoids. I think there's a lot of education that could be had that is sort of getting uh, circumvented just because people are, are going straight to the recreational and then sort of self-treating, I guess like they've been doing for 5,000 years. But now we actually have a good number of doctors that know a lot about cannabis and can really work with people. Uh, you know, there are medication interactions, there are increased anesthesia requirements if you use cannabis every day. And, you know, there's no reason for there not to be a doctor educating the patients, a doctor or nurse about these things. Um, and then yeah. uh, the, the, the medical patients just feel sort of like uh, neglected and like all the emphasis from the companies and from the, um, you know, the active, the, the people in the industry is on the recreational because that's where most of the money is. And they sort of feel like they're being blown off. So I don't think you asked about protections for medical patients. I don't think we have very well, very good protections for medical patients. I don't think it was really anticipated that the min minute recreational came along, everybody would be like, what's medical? Let's focus on recreational. So I think we actually do need a lot more protections for the medical patients. Yeah. And that's what I get on my soapbox is that I think the onus is on certainly on the regulatory bodies that, um, to enforce, and I mean, to host public health education that, as you said, there's no healthcare provider as part of that trans, that commercial transaction, you know, a 21 and over is going into a, into a dispensary. Hey, want some gummies? I hear they're really good for my chronic pain. And, um, you know, then they're going ahead and grabbing, uh, like, oh, well here we've got a bar chocolate bar. That's, you know, 25 milligrams and just break off a square that you're going to be fine. And it's just, it's dangerous. You know, I, I just, uh, I actually was at a medical dispensary uh -huh. six months ago, speaking to a whole group of addiction psychiatrists from my hospital. And then I was just, you know, snooping around the dispensary for fun. And they had a chocolate bar with 1,100 milligrams. Now, how could you put that in a chocolate bar? Each little square was like 110 milligrams. If I take 10 milligrams, whatever, I'm, uh, in the past, I've been good. 110 mm -hmm. milligrams per square. Yeah. And then the THC, the little label that said THC, you needed an electron microscope to see it. It wasn't labeled very mm -hmm. well at all. And that's just a disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. So. I just think um, medical patients need protections and um, they also need a lot more support, encouragement and incentives to go through the legal system as opposed to just going back to the illicit market. Yeah, thank you for that. And so to wrap it up, uh, so you are moderating the panel on emerging trends and innovation in the, in the medical industry. So what are you excited about? 
Well, I'm excited. I always prefer, believe it or not, after this interview where I've given these like long answers, I much more prefer to listen than to talk. So mm-hmm. I'm just looking forward to being around a group of smart, engaged people and, and, and hearing what they have to say. I mean, certainly the delivery methods are fascinating. The new mm-hmm. the new um, sort of, I don't want to say strains, the new chemovars, the new understanding of the new, new early, the more newly discovered cannabinoids are really mm-hmm. fascinating. A lot of the technology is really interesting. And a lot of the innovations in data and monitoring patients are really interesting. So I just think it's a sort of an infinitely um, broad and fascinating topic. And I just, I can't wait to see what people bring to the panel. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me today. And uh, the summarize of so Dr. Uh, Grinspoon will be part of the uh, Boston Cannabis MD Cannabis Science and Policy Forum that we're hosting June 16th. That's Friday uh, at Boston Seaport. And for more information on Cannabis MD, the forum, Cannabis MD period, and then as well as TPAD, it's CannabisMD.com, and TPAD is T-E-A-P-A-D.co, and if people would like to hold up that book again, and where can they find your book? Well, they, it should be in all the bookstores, and yep. you can get it easily on Amazon, and you could find it and me uh, on my website, it's just www.PeterGrinspoon.com, and the Grinspoon's just grin like smile, spoon like fork. So uh, and awesome. I, if people have questions, they can send me a question um, on my website as well. I'm always happy to answer questions. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and excited to see you uh, just over a month. Yeah, look, thank you for having me and look forward to seeing you next month. It's going to be a, a really spectacular conference. Yep, thank you.